On September 23, 1959, history was made in the small town of Coon Rapids, Iowa. Surrounded by hundreds of National Guardsmen, reporters, and journalists from all around the country, standing in the middle of a cornfield, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev gave the world the first glimpse of hope that peace was possible between the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The ongoing Cold War had increased tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States as the threat of nuclear war was looming. Yet in the midst of the Cold War standoff between the two superpowers, Premier Khrushchev had accepted an invitation from Iowa farmer Roswell Garst to visit his family farm and to see firsthand America's successful farming methods and agricultural practices. In an act of citizen diplomacy, Roswell Garst welcomed Nikita Khrushchev to his farm and home in 1959, which sparked much debate among Americans. However, the visit between Garst and Khrushchev helped to form a mutual understanding between the Soviet Union and the United States that ultimately led to the first thaw in the Cold War. And it all began with corn. In a special White House conference, President Eisenhower reads the text of a joint announcement released simultaneously in Moscow. The President of the United States has invited Mr. Nikito Khrushchev Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, to pay an official visit to the United States in September. Mr. Khrushchev will visit Washington for two or three days and will also spend 10 days or so traveling in the United States. The two-week visit included stops in Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Des Moines, Iowa, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and finally to Camp David, where he concluded his trip with meetings with President Eisenhower. Upon accepting Eisenhower's invitation, Khrushchev made two requests, that he would be allowed to visit Disneyland and that he could travel to see his friend Roswell Garst in Tor Garst, Iowa Farm. Nikita Khrushchev's American tour swings into the world's best corn country. Nikita Khrushchev arrived at the Garst Farm in Coon Rapids, Iowa on September 23, 1959. I remember going to the farm that morning with my dad, uh, driving to the event and going through several checkpoints in Coon Rapids, one on 4th and Elm and another on 4th and Main and then another one on 5th and Main. And my dad explaining who he was over and over and lots of National Guardsmen hanging around with machine guns on the corners and looking at ID. Uh, this is in Coon Rapids, Iowa, pretty amazing. The visit prompted great debate among many of the citizens of Iowa as protesters lined the streets. The phrase, we will bury you, was ingrained in the minds of many Americans. Only a few years earlier, Khrushchev had made the remarks to a room full of diplomats at the Polish embassy in Moscow. Local farmers stopped buying Garst's products, citing they refused to support communists. The debate over Khrushchev's intentions caused divisions among Americans who were living under the constant fear of nuclear war. These anomalous circumstances led to one resounding question. How was it that the communist leader of the Soviet Union was now stomping through the cornfields of Coon Rapids, Iowa? The answer? Citizen diplomacy. After emerging as leader of the Soviet Union in 1955, Nikita Khrushchev set about on his mission of reversing the inhumane ways of his predecessor, Joseph Stalin, and immediately began his pursuit of improving agriculture technology in the Soviet Union, beginning with the introduction of corn. Khrushchev addressed the Communist Central Committee in 1955. During this speech, Khrushchev praised American farm practices in the heartland and expressed interest in learning from American farmers how the Soviet Union could increase food production through the development of feed livestock agriculture. As the Soviet Union was struggling to feed its people, America's crops and food supply was bountiful, due in part to an Iowan farmer named Roswell Garst. Garst was an innovator in agriculture. He was best known for his hybrid corn seed. Garst hybrid corn seed produced greater yields of quality corn, which was used to feed livestock, resulting in improved livestock production. Khrushchev did not view America's advancement in agricultural practices as a threat. Rather, he felt that he could use America's technology as a tool that would solve his country's food insecurity problem. Roswell Garst strongly believed in the idea of citizen diplomacy. 
the idea that private citizens can build important relationships with foreign nations when governments and diplomats fail, because unlike governments, citizens are not confined by policy and history. In 1956, President Eisenhower convened the White House Summit on Citizen Diplomacy. Eisenhower wanted the country to know that in the midst of the possibility of nuclear war, peace was every American's cause to take up. If we are going to have, take advantage of the assumption that all people want peace, then the problem is for people to get together, to leap governments, if necessary, to evade governments, to work out not one method, but thousands of methods by which people can gradually learn a little bit more of each other. The notion that citizens could make a difference and act as diplomats for their country fueled Roswell Garst's relentless pursuit for an export license that would allow him to sell his corn seed to the Soviets. This plan seemed highly unlikely because at the time, the State Department would not allow any exports from the United States to the Soviet Union. Garst believed that hungry people were dangerous people. The State Department eventually granted Garst the export license. This set a great precedent for future trade with the Soviet Union. Khrushchev's son, Sergei Khrushchev, later noted that the export license with no time limit punched the first major hole in the Iron Curtain. Days before Khrushchev's arrival to Coon Rapids, hundreds of reporters ascended upon the Iowa town. Garst was not interested in the media attention and was infuriated by the mass of reporters stumbling through his cornfields. Khrushchev not only wanted to learn about corn production, but he wanted to see how Garst's high-yield corn seed ultimately led to increased meat production. While in Iowa, Khrushchev toured the Bookie Meat Packing Plant. Here he interacted with many working-class Americans. It was the common citizens that Khrushchev was interested in learning from. My father was in the meat packing business. Khrushchev ran right over to me and kind of put his arm right by me. And, and the only thing I remembered about Khrushchev is that they had just gone, Sputnik had gone to the moon. So I looked up to him and I said, and I said to him, I said, you beat us to the moon, but we make better hot dogs. Khrushchev bonded with the farmers in Iowa and wanted to interact with the crowds. He shook hands, hugged children, and patted the full bellies of those he met. These interactions were significant because Khrushchev felt connected and loved by the American people. This was an unforeseen consequence of the groundbreaking trip. His visit did not win anyone over to communism. Khrushchev did, however, win people over with his personality and the way he related to the citizens of Iowa. In 1963, the cool and rainy spring and early summer in the Soviet Union proved disastrous for corn production and over 80% of the acreage that had been planted withered and died. Khrushchev's obsession with corn ultimately contributed to his downfall. In his later memoir, Khrushchev acknowledged his failed attempt to replicate the Iowa Corn Belt when he remarked, corn was discredited and so was I. Khrushchev and Garst had bonded over their obsession with corn. Their unlikely friendship had made Americans and Soviets alike see the world where they could coexist together without the threat of nuclear war. Roswell Garst was an ordinary citizen who turned a corner in history by reaching out to the premier of the Soviet Union and offering the leader the opportunity to feed his people. Acting as a citizen diplomat, Garst allowed America to gain access to Soviet markets, something politicians, including Eisenhower himself, had failed to do. Garst once remarked to Khrushchev, we two farmers could settle the problems of the world faster than diplomats. Suppose the United States had not allowed Garst the export license. Or what if Roswell Garst refused to help Khrushchev out of fear of their political differences? History could have played out much differently. Khrushchev formed personal relationships with the people he met, especially those he met in Coon Rapids, and he valued those relationships. These relationships that were forged served to strengthen the mutual understanding between the two countries. Perhaps one of the factors that deterred Khrushchev from ever pushing the nuclear button was the reality of the destruction that nuclear war would cause. Khrushchev now personally knew the country and the people who would suffer from his missile strikes. It was unthinkable that he would destroy the people whose hands he shook, whose children he hugged, and the home and farm of his friend Roswell Garst. No matter how tense relations between the United States and the Soviet Union became, Khrushchev now had far more to lose than he ever had before, and it all began 
with corn. Macy, that's a fantastic documentary. I'm really curious how you came to the topic of Nikita Khrushchev visiting Iowa. <laughs> Well, I actually frequently watch um, PBS history documentaries. It's just something I enjoy doing in my free time. Um, and one random weekend in, I believe it was June, I was watching one with my mother and it was called the Cold War Roadshow. And it was about the entire trip that Khrushchev took to the United States, not just specifically um, to Iowa. And um, I, the portion about Iowa was only actually about 10 minutes in the whole film. Um, but it really stuck out to me and intrigued me because it was just so strange that Nikita Khrushchev was walking through a cornfield in the United States in the middle of the Cold War. And I, I just had to know more. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know about him visiting Disneyland. I know about him visiting Hollywood sound stages. I had no idea that he went to Iowa. So this was a really fascinating documentary for me. And you have tons of archival footage in it. So can you talk a little bit about your research process and where you found that footage? Right, so I began my research in about the, towards the end of June um, last year. And um, I basically began right after I saw the film, The Cold War Roadshow, and I just started kind of doing, you know, your random Google searches, trying to figure out what exactly happened. Um, but then I started really digging into um, the photographs I was coming across. And I came across two specific photographs that um, resonated with me. One um, was of a little boy looking up at Nikita Khrushchev, and I was like, he has to still, um, like, he has to still be alive. I, sure enough, I can, like, get him to talk to me about this. Um, and then the same thing was with um, Roswell Garth's um, granddaughter, um, a very similar photograph of her speaking with the premiere. Um, and so from there, I kind of dived into that rabbit hole, trying to figure out who these people were. Um, and so when I got in contact with Elizabeth Garst, she really referred me to a lot of resources I could utilize from um, the Iowa region. Because I'm all the way in Texas, it was a little difficult to find those primary sources um, that you would get from universities in Iowa and libraries and archives there. So she was really helpful in terms of that. Um, and Harry Bucky as well. I sent him a letter um, just in the mail randomly, hoping that he might would answer um, and he did about three months later, um, and he sent, he actually gave me access to his family's, um, like, personal archive of photographs from the day that Khrushchev visited his um, father's um, meatpacking plant, so. So basically, you did some cold calls on what? people just <laughs> to find this, in, but, but they responded in a positive way. It actually led you on to other things. I mean, those personal connections, I would, I would guess, are really uh, important as you're making a documentary a lot of times. Yes, very much so important. So I, you're, you determined that you were going, you wanted to interview them because you had seen them in other places? Um, I had seen them in photographs when I was doing my research as little kids. They were about eight years old at the time. Um, and I really think oral histories are so important when it comes to making films. Um, and that's why I always really um, focus on topics that lend themselves well to a film and to a documentary um, where there is good footage and there are people who can talk about it to you, you know. Um, so they were a very important part of my project for sure. So I'm, I'm really curious how you structured this. I mean, I, you know, you only had 10 minutes and that might seem like a lot of time to tell a story, but as you well know, it definitely is not. So how did you decide to structure this and, and put some boundaries around it? Because, you know, you need to explain who Nikita Khrushchev is. You need to explain why he was in Iowa. And then, you know, and then you even you followed up a little bit at the end about kind of the results of his trip. So talk about the process that you went through to, you know, kind of boundary this. Well, I always begin with what I like to call a storyboard. 
um, where I kind of get a general script. It's almost like writing your history paper before it comes to life in the form of a documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I begin there and then I kind of go through and with the um, footage and photographs I've already collected, I go through and kind of annotate where I think those should go. Um, but this year, I, with the 10 minute time limit, I found it very difficult to make sure I told the whole story because there's so much there to tell. And so I was very challenged in that aspect. Um, just having to leave out things that were so interesting and so cool. Um, like I came across this commercial about corn and it was the first commercial ever produced in the Soviet Union. And it was so unique and interesting and it couldn't go in the film because of the 10 minute time limit. Um, but yeah, and then I ended up going back and adding in a rewind effect um, into my script because I just wasn't really happy with the layout of the way I was having to tell the story. So I felt like it was best to set the stage of what was about to happen and then go all the way back before Khrushchev came into the picture. Oh, you anticipated my next question, which was about that rewind effect. (laughs) I thought that that was really, really effective. How did you decide to use that? Well, I just... I wanted to do something different. I've done documentaries for a while now, um, for about five years now. Um, and I wanted just something unique and, but also that would lend itself well to the story. Um, and so as I was compiling my script and started editing my film and my program, I realized that something just wasn't quite right with the way, um, the timeline was there. Like it was so chronological that it just felt like blatant history facts being thrown at you. Um, So I felt like that cinematic aspect that I was able to throw in um, really did um, make a huge difference artistically. You know, you say that you like watching documentaries in your spare time. Do you find that, uh, you know, in having watched a lot of documentaries, you've absorbed a lot of lessons from those? I would say yes. Um, I have found that I have a very unique style of what I like to see in a film. Um, And I've kind of made that the way I edit as well. Um, I think that flashy can only take you so far. And so I'm very interested in keeping it simple, but clean. Um, And so I feel like that has definitely transferred because that's most of what you see on PBS and the History Channel. Um, So that has definitely transferred into the way I edit as well. So do you, do you find that there's a line to walk between, you know, this like historical document that you want to make, but you also want to make it artistic as well? Yes, definitely. And I think this year, um, especially, I was able to kind of find that sweet spot um, that I don't really think I had ever explored fully before. So was there any part of the research or the putting together of this documentary that surprised you? I would say just the way that Khrushchev was perceived by Americans. Um, When we learn about Khrushchev in our history books in history class, we don't typically learn about this. Um, And we learn about this stone cold, you know, ruthless leader. Well, in America, people were excited to welcome him here and they were excited to embrace his visit. And he enjoyed meeting the American people. And that was a unique side of this story that I didn't really expect to come across. So what was the most fun part of doing this documentary? Um, Well, besides the, just when something clicks, especially like that rewind effect, I worked on that for so long. And whenever I was able to run into my mom's room at like two in the morning and tell her, look what I did. um, I think getting to compete in person at Texas History Day this year was, um, a big highlight for me. Um, I just love getting to tell the story to people face to face and to judges. Um, And that was something I haven't got to do in so long. So I really enjoyed that. Well, Macy, congratulations on your award. It's a, a really fantastic documentary and appreciate you joining us. Thank you.